I find perfection very boring. You know, I'm, I'm looking for something slightly different. And that's why, well, if you look at my pots, they're not perfectly round. They'll have scars on from the fire. Um, but that's everything that I'm looking for in, in wood firing. I remember when I was at, at Derby training and there was a girl there. I fell in love with the man. Not because she was beautiful, she'd got a scar down her face and she was different, you know what I mean? And, and she was stunner. And, and if my pots can carry that kind of power, then that I'm happy with that. Very happy with that. I grew up just outside of Stratford-on-Avon and um, I purchased my first bag of clay from the potter Barbara Cass, although she didn't know that I was making pipes for smoking hash with <laughs> Anyway, I ended up at Derby, our Derby College of Higher Ed, where I did BTEC Studio Ceramics. And I was pretty much given a free reign. You know, I'd got a big pile of fire bricks and we could sit up there all night firing kilns, building kilns. And gradually, um, I, it just became an obsession. Um, clay was everything. Most uh, courses these days, if you can find one in ceramics, they seem to be so against tradition and I, I really don't understand why. It's something that's it's exciting and, you know, I look at medieval pots and I get great pleasure out of something really simple. But they're, they're made from the heart, you know, not too much of this. And you can really see those pots that have that kind, that, that have captured that essence of that feeling. I came out of Derby, really didn't know what I was going to do. And um, I ended up in, I had got a little mini pickup and I went down to South the south of Italy and worked in a little pottery there for a short while and then came back up through Germany and worked for a potter in Germany who was a wood firer and that's where I saw this old wheel which I'd built from a photograph and then I came back to um, England and I got a thousand pounds in my pocket and a mini pickup, my wheel, and a thousand bricks, which I'd swapped for a teapot from a brick company in Sheffield. And uh, my first firing, we hadn't got enough wood, and I barely got cone nine, and I ended up burning all my wear boards to get cone nine over. But um, they're probably the worst pots I've ever made, and I'm sure they'll turn up and haunt me someday but they were our saviour because we've got a kiln load of pots and we managed to sell them. I started at powder mills in 88 and it was a, a pretty wild place. It literally is middle of Dartmoor. And at that time, there was this kind of anti-brown pot, anti-leech thing going on. And brightly coloured earthenware was very fashionable. So here I was in the middle of nowhere making brown pots <laughs> but still managed to survive. We get a lot of German potters through, you might have noticed there's quite a few here. But their kind of way of making pots is so different to what it is, to what I do. Um, they're more about the head rather than the heart. So they would take a lump of clay and they're taught to throw it as thinly as possible, as wide, get as, squeeze as much out of that as you can and fast. Which is kind of okay, but you know, sometimes I feel it might be missing the point 
of that feeling that's needed in an ice pot. And as a result of that kind of throwing, then the pots become very mean and very sharp and not something you want to pick up. And it, it's not just a case of being able to throw a pot well, it's about injecting something extra, something special. Went through that process of throwing as thinly as I could myself and as evenly and as many as possible off the wheel in a day. And then it, there comes a time when you have to undo that. Still keep that quality, you know, it, it's not a badly thrown pot, but to be able to undo that whole process and step back and the pot becomes a thing, a visual thing, and a thing about balance and the weight. Sometimes you need a heavy pot. If it's too light, it's just wrong. Sometimes it needs to be heavy, you know. And, and also the physical things in the kiln, you know. If it's something that's too fine, the way I kind of stack the pots, the way I treat them, it just wouldn't work. They'd just fold over. There we go. <laughs> and I think perhaps the firing is one of the most important things in, for me as a potter. I still love making pots very much. You know, the whole process I like to do, mixing the clay, the glazes, it's all, being a potter, it's all about that. I do a four day firing and I make the pots to fit in various parts of the kiln. And I like to stack pots on the side. You know, most people, most potters would stack a pot that way up. But with wood fire, and then where the flame hits the wads that it sat on, that's where it makes all the interesting things. So if that was just stacked upright, you'd, you'd have a very boring pot. All the interesting things would be on the bottom. So that's why it's important for me to stack things on the side and against one another. And um, I do a lot with the fire, so I, I kind of, it, it's not just about getting it up to temperature. There's a lot of side stoking, so I surround pots with embers, and I play around with the fire. Temperature doesn't really matter at this point. It's the last day that I go for the temperature rise. It's custom for us, we have a big fried breakfast on the last morning of the firing, you know, so for a moment the kiln gets stuffed full of wood and gives us all time to have a good feed and then we get back to the firing. So it's all kind of, the social side of it is important to me too. It brings the best out of the people, I think, having a firing. And that, that's another thing with wood firing, I think, you have to be prepared to take those um, failures and be prepared to get on and do it again. You know, that's, I think that's probably the drive for a wood firer is that nine times out of, well, most of the time, it's not what you expect. So you get up and you do it again, you know, and you get it hopefully right next time. You know, a lot of people also say it's accidental, which is, makes me feel a little bit angry that these results are an accident, because they're not, you know, it's all very controlled. Um, it's out of control control, if, <laughs> if that makes any sense. You know, you have an idea and you push for that, but always it comes out something unexpected and always open up the kiln and it's very disappointing and you have to go away, come back with a fresh mind and look at what, what you've got. And that's what fires up, up a wood fire, I think that's what keeps them going. A Japanese pot who was extremely influential for me and that's a guy called Shiro Tsuchimuru who came to Devon and stayed with some friends of mine 
and worked for an exhibition in the Besson Gallery in London. Now this guy came over, he was not your usual Japanese potter. He was actually the son of a dairy farmer and then went on to become a Buddhist monk and then got into pots looking at antique Japanese pots. But he approached it in the manner that a child would. Um, he'd seen this pot and he'd made up it, his mind in his own head how that had been made and he'd do it. And this guy, he broke all the rules. And um, beautiful pots, absolutely stunning. But they had that, that soul in them, you know, it's, they had that feeling, that kind of primeval, deep down, something that grabs you. But I went along, he fired this little kiln, fired with oil, and threw wood ash on the pots. And um, then I went, just as he was finishing the firing, and he was climbing up, and all he did was throw this wadge of clay on the big hole where the oil burner was, and there were holes everywhere, it was like, you know, like a cathedral with all the light shining out. And everything that I'd been taught told me those pots will all be dunted, they'll all be crowded, there'll be nothing left. And I went along the next day thinking they'd all be rubbish. And, and he opened up this kiln and pulled out this first pot. Man, my heart, oh, it was a stunner, real stunner. But that was a valuable lesson for me, you know, it taught me that rules are there to break. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but when you kind of take those risks, then you will get reward. What you do the last two minutes of this firing, that determines everything, I, I believe. You know, how you finish that kiln off, what you do. And a lot of things, there's no kind of written written way to do it. it. It can change with what wood you're using, how the condition of the wood, i.e. is it green, is it bone dry, is it a little bit damp, weather conditions, you know, anything, anything changes it. And you're constantly looking in the kiln, reading the fire, the speed of the flame, where the flame's hitting and reduction, colour, temperature, there's millions and millions of things that you have to register. So of course, you know, you're going to get some things wrong. So I don't hardly ever sleep when I'm firing. You know, and I quite often come out and shock the person who's out there about putting a bit of wood in the kiln and I'm out there in my underpants just checking that everything's all right because I'm laying in bed worrying, worried sick about it, but there's no need to. Um, but I like, as I say, I think the end of the firing is perhaps the most important to read what's happened and uh, to be able to react. It's quite easy to give up too early and um, walk away, whereas another five minutes, you know, would have made a disastrous firing into a beautiful firing. Um, so that's why I like to be as fresh as possible. In the past I have thrown pots up against the wall and in a fit of rage. But I've learnt that's the wrong thing to do. You know, you change your mind and you just have to live with something. Unpacking the kiln I, I kind of still find difficult. That initial cracking open of the kiln. You know, and it's certainly in these style of kilns, these tunnel kilns, um, you, you just see the front face, the top face, and it's into a dark tunnel. And you think, oh my God, it's dreadful, it's awful. And then you just, I usually get Halper or somebody to unbrick it, and I have a cup of tea and build up my courage and come and have a little peep, walk away, maybe take out a pot and... I have learnt to be patient and just wait, yeah. So many modern kilns 
and modern materials for building accounts are so efficient that you don't have to do the work to get to temperature. And if you don't put in that hard work, you're going to get damn boring pots. You know, so if, if you're prepared to, I don't know, do a six hour firing, call it wood fired, because your kiln is brilliant, you can get to temperature in six hours. If you want those pots that come out of it, fine. I'd rather kind of fire something that's about to fall down and really difficult and struggle and uh, get something that's interesting. And um, yeah, yeah. And I think that was another lesson taught by Shiro. You know, it's not all about efficiency. It's quite often inefficiency produces much, much more interesting results. Hot. Glazed floor. And up we come. And let's turn over, see what we've got. And this one looks a beaut. It looks a real special piece. So I think you might see this one, unless I find any disasters, might come into the exhibition. Lovely pop. <laughs> Made me a happy man. <laughs> so this has been sat, you can see the blue Blue's moving into the mauve purple from the reduction where it's been sat close to the embers and then it's got oxidation as well so you get this variation of colour moving through from that blue to purple and then the jade green of the ash and then on the other side where it's been sheltered from the embers it's a very pale green, lots of ash. Very nice piece. Very unusual to get that combination of all of those things going on in such a little pot. Beautiful. And here's another one that looks very, very nice. Again, we've stoked through the stoke hole and it's been sat in the embers and there's this dark purpley, real rich quiet colours with the ash here. This is actually a refire, this has been in for the second time. You know wood firing, unlike an electric fired pot, what you see on an electric fired pot or a highly decorated pot is what you get. It doesn't get any better. But there's so much to explore within a wood-fired pot. Just by turning it that little bit round and you have a different face, it's a different pot. A little bit more and again it's different. So you have a whole, whole, whole story to explore. It's just like reading a book, nothing different. There's pinks, there's greens, there's blues. There's crystal ash, there's some lovely crystals growing here during the cooling. And how can people call it a brown pot? You know, it's, it's millions of colours in there. There's a kind of a grey area, isn't there, between studio ceramics and kind of art, fine art. And I think wood firing is kind of in that grey area, you know, it, it's not just about pots. And, and I think that area is very kind of positive and strong, you know, and it's really only wood firing that kind of reaches into that, I think. You know, very difficult to do electric fired pots in that area or gas fired pots but with wood firing you kind of it's it's like a painting and when i pack the kiln that's exactly what i'm doing you know i'm kind of imagining where the fire is going to hit and what clay i'm using what kind of color palette i'm going to get and you know where's that ash going to run if this fire flame is going to hit this pot and then weave around and hit the other one so i can imagine so it is like a painting 
and but slightly out of control painting. <laughs> yeah.